back to the Environmental Law Monitor. I'm your host, Daniel Pope. This podcast is brought to you by Bracewell LLP's Environment, Lands, and Resources Group, and we're glad you're taking some of the time out of your day to spend it with us. Or you might be multitasking and working out or doing something else. If that's the case, you've totally got this next set. One of the things that we have wanted to do with the monitor is to cover new and interesting topics. And at the same time, keep tabs on key areas of environmental and natural resources law and policy. And that obviously includes topics like enforcement. Today, we're going to be blending our goals and talking about current trends in environmental enforcement and federal enforcement more broadly. So I'm excited to have in the room with me today, Kevin Collins and Jason Hutt. Kevin's in our Austin office, Jason's in our DC office, and they're both members of our environment, lands, and resources team. And we've got a special guest from our DC office as well, Bob Wagman, who's a partner. And instead of trying to describe what you do and your experience, Bob, I'd love to toss it to you and uh, introduce yourself, would you, for us? Well, thank you, Daniel. And first, it's great to be here with you guys. I head up the government contracts practice here at Bracewell. So if there's government money involved, I get involved. And government money is in everything these days. Relevant here, I do a lot of government enforcement work. Some of that is government contractors in trouble. Some of it's criminal. Some of it's civil. But we also deal with a lot of ancillary issues. And what we're going to talk about today is part of the environmental enforcement. There are administrative remedies that are available to the government, specifically suspension and debarment. It's uh, a lot of my waking hours over the past couple of months have been dealing with suspension and debarment issues arising out of uh, criminal civil enforcement within the environmental space. So it's just a natural extension of the types of things we're talking about today and very happy to be here to share with you. Thanks for being here with us, Bob. And Kevin and Jason, you know, the three of you spend quite a bit of time on the front lines of enforcement actions. So I'd love to hear uh, what are y'all seeing generally these days from DOJ in the criminal enforcement context? And uh, after that, maybe we can talk a little bit about what EPA is doing on the civil side. Sure, Daniel. So, you know, I think there's been a resurgence in activity at DOJ. I think they feel invigorated uh, under the new administration. And so, for example, the stats support that feeling. The United States Attorney's offices across the country are up about 10% in their charges. They've charged roughly 5,500 individuals for white-collar-related crimes. Environment Natural Resources Division, in particular at DOJ, has already indicted 11 companies and 34 individuals, and many of those individuals are senior executives. In budget-wise, they're asking for a lot more money. I think probably looking at maybe $325 million for more FBI agents across the country. So there's definitely interest in sort of going after bad actors, particularly individuals at companies to a certain extent. Attorney General Garland said this last month in a meeting to a group of individuals that um, they're, they're, they're waxing, you know, with the moon, the moon gets bigger. They're, they're in a waxing stage. So just be, be aware of that. But let's, let's talk specifics for this audience that relates to them. You know, the Western District of Texas, my district, uh, U.S. Attorney's Office has indicted an oil field company on a worker, uh, worker death case that's got Clean Air Act violations, worker safety violations, Safe Water Drinking Act violations. But I think more importantly, and you've heard me say this before and your audience has heard me say this before, you've got these regulatory violations and then you've got lying, cheating, or stealing. And, and that's what we had here. We had an instance in which the company is alleged to have provided false statements to the Texas Railroad Commission about some of its safety programs. And I think when you have that combined with the facts of this particular case, and we'll get into that a little bit later, you get enforcement. And then Jason, I, you know, there's an Eastern District of Texas civil settlement uh, that involves flaring. But I think the reason why the company, the, the government went after him was because of the environmental justice angle to, the, to that particular case, you know, where the flaring was occurring uh, with, you know, underrepresented communities. So yeah, I'll pass it over to Jason. He can talk a little bit more about civil related stuff. Yeah, I was definitely going to say in response to Daniel's question, and I don't have statistics on this, but my experience has been that the counterparty as the federal government is less lenient in how it views the resolution of cases shy of of trial. So it's sort of a postural shift that I have seen uh, inside of the agency. And I think that some of that comes with, you know, the change of administration, but we're still enforcing the same 
environmental laws, but the leniency factor or the posture factor is different. And, and then sort of, sort of building off of what Kevin flagged from the Eastern District case, part of the settlement expectations is increasingly a focus on uh, protection of the community in which a facility or a violator operates. And so we see increase, we are seeing increased expectations related to fence line monitoring uh, demands and reparations or mitigation under uh, a resolution that involves making things right or righter, not really a word, but uh, in the community where the, where the violation occurs or where the environmental damage associated with that violation occurs. So those are, those are pieces that I have seen as sort of a, a posture shift in the government. I would say, you know, to, to borrow the waxing phrase, monitor ships are waxing as well, right? So uh, the government recognizes that it has a finite amount of resources. It's seeking more budget in this next fiscal year. But even then, uh, what they want to do is use an independent third party to provide a degree of oversight in the future for a criminal violator. And that's the notion of these independent monitors that are part of settlement documents. And even, I think Bob would add that sometimes the suspension department office has asked for its own monitor to play a role in keeping an eye on someone who has uh, a criminal history uh, with, uh, from, on the environmental side. Yeah, there's definitely this idea, this concept of force mul- multipliers within the government, you know, like Jason was describing. And you know, on that fence line monitoring issue, that Eastern Dest- District case is very illustrative of Jason's point, because what the government's doing in that settlement context is they're demanding more from the company through a settlement than they could get under the face of the regulations. And it includes enhanced fence line monitoring and root cause investigations when there's when there's exceedances of that monitoring which otherwise the company wouldn't have to put forward so that, I think I think that's quite interesting so Bob I'd love to hear your thoughts and what you're seeing but one of the terms that has come up a few times on this podcast already uh, is the term suspension and debarment and I think that Kevin and Jason have experience with that obviously you've got experience with that but I've not yet dealt with that. And we've got a lot of listeners to this podcast who are EHS professionals, consultants, people that might not be thinking about suspension and debarment issues on the day-to-day like you are. So as you provide some context to what Kevin and Jason are seeing and, and you share what you're seeing, I would also love sort of your quickest suspension and debarment for dummies course so that some of us can get on the same page with both of you. Sure. So when you think about government enforcement, I think of it as a three-lane highway. So you've got your criminal, your civil, and your administrative. Suspension debarment falls in the administrative lane. And it's one of those that you don't often see coming because criminal sanctions, civil sanctions, they usually go out first and the administrative remedies always come later. So a lot of times uh, I'll get involved in suspension and debarment. The other thing I want to mention about it is it's remedial. So a lot of companies will enter into a global settlement to resolve all their criminal and civil liability with the government related to, you know, in this context, environmental enforcement action. And they're still facing suspension and debarment on the back end after they've agreed to some of these sort of onerous requirements just to make, you know, try to buy peace. And then they end up dealing with suspension and debarment on the back end. Um, and this comes up a lot because a lot of companies don't realize suspension and debarment will impact them. It's not just for government contractors. A lot of times it'll apply to both procurement actions and what's called non-procurement actions. And the term that's used in the regulations is covered transactions, which is essentially anything that's not exempted out. So any, when I say there's government money involved, chances are it's a covered transaction. Uh, Comes up a lot with federal leases. If you are a federal lessee or if you are an oil field services company servicing federal lessees. Uh, suspension and debarment can have a, a tremendous impact on your business. And a lot of times this is um, companies, individuals, they don't think about suspension and debarment, the administrative remedy that could be uh, associated with it. So in, in, in broad strokes, suspension and debarment is you're excluded from doing business with the federal government for some period of time, usually three years, but it can vary. Usually follows criminal or civil enforcement, but doesn't have to follow civil or criminal enforcement. It can come from any referrals. And there's a couple different uh, couple different ways going about it. And by that, I mean relevant here under both the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. 
there's an automatic statutory debarment. So any conviction, any judgment entered for a violation of Clean Air, Clean Water Act, misdemeanor, felony, negligent, intentional, it doesn't matter. There's an automatic debarment that comes with it. So the chances are, if, if you're facing environmental enforcement, it is almost certainly going to end up on the radar of the suspension and debarment office, where they're going to look to see whether or not, well, one, if you're statutorily debarred, you're going to be precluded from doing entering into contracts and cover transactions, which we just talked about is broader than simply contracts. And you can also face discretionary debarment, which is the government makes a formal determination that you are not responsible, which responsibility essentially means you're you're trustworthy. And I'm, I'm oversimplifying it, but just a little bit. But basically, you're a trustworthy uh, company that we should be doing business with. And then you could be precluded from any kind of, of government, you know, covered transactions, government contracts, and, and broadly speaking. And I, I want to point out too that in environmental law, we sort of have a third rail, and that is the concept of disqualification. So under the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, if there's a, a violation, certain types of violations at a facility, the facility can receive the same sort of treatment. And then it, and then it depends on, and Bob can expand on that, but I'm sure, but it depends, in certain circumstances, it's always, it's sometimes difficult to identify the location of the facility at which the violation occurred, right? If you have a piece of linear infrastructure, like a pipeline, and the pipeline has a rupture, question for the, and there's no address associated with that, it's more difficult for the government to pinpoint where that facility is. And so they may take a more expansive view. We saw that in the Deepwater Horizon case when the location of the underlying violation was on on the uh, on an oil rig and the government made the determination that the facility that was subject to the disqualification was a corporate address as opposed to the location where the, where the accident occurred. So that's a, another concept that's introduced in, in addition to suspension and debarment is disqualification when we're talking about environmental law. Okay, so that's, that's interesting to me because I've been here going on four years and most of the work that I've done that's related to enforcement involves assessing whether sort of a penalty is within the matrix, right? Or reviewing how onerous affirmative relief in a consent decree might be for a company. I haven't engaged with the suspension debarment issues. Do you think it's fair to say that it's sort of like a sneakier, not sneaky in the sense of subterfuge, but maybe it kind of flies under the radar. And then Bob, you were talking about how after you think you've settled with the government or you've resolved claims, then you've got this suspension and debarment process to deal with. In your experience, is that something that sort of catches people by surprise? Absolutely. And it can come up a lot of times. Again, Every time there's a criminal settlement, a civil settlement, there's always press releases. There's always a lot of hoopla around it for, you know, for, for deterrence reasons. Suspension and debarment, your word was sneaky, but it, it tends to be quieter. That that's, you're, you're put on a list and if you go check the list, you'll see you there, but there's not press releases. There's usually not a whole lot of hoopla and it's usually months or sometimes even years after resolution of the civil criminal when, when the the initial excitement has died down. And to you know, your point, it doesn't always come up. So Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, those are automatic statutory debarment issues, but otherwise it's going to have to be referred to the suspension and debarment official. Somebody's going to have to make an affirmative determination that this violation does raise questions for us. So a lot of times you can resolve certain types of investigations, certain types of violations, which won't necessarily result in suspension and debarment, but they could. I don't think it should sneak up on you, though. And Kevin, you should expand on this. But when you're talking to a prosecutor about a resolution, you should be talking to them about the Philip factors, right? And inside of that, or what are the co- what are the collateral consequences to the company of taking whatever plea or, or resolution is in front of you? And this should be one of the things that you would raise: is Hey, we're going to have to go. We may have to go through this separate process, and here are the consequences of that process. I agree with what you're saying. And part of the issue is suspension and debarment officials are separate and independent. So the Department of Justice doesn't have any, any, certainly any actual authority to resolve suspension and debarment issues. And they're probably not as likely to reach out and talk to suspension and debarment officials, at least my experience. They're not going to reach out affirmatively to them saying, we got to resolve all this at once and we need your help. And much more is going to be after the fact where you see suspension and debarment officials reaching out to the prosecutors. Tell me what I'm not seeing in the four corners of the pleadings. But it's a, it's just a different resolution process. And they're sort of, more, they're much more 
separate and sort of parallel processes. And like I said, they don't always come up. You know, certain violations are definitely going to come up, but they don't always come up. Yeah, I, there's a tension there, um, Jason and Bob, that, that you guys were talking about. And, and, and Jason's right. You know, when you're sitting down with a prosecutor and you're working through your list of issues, there's a real tension between what the prosecutor wants, right? They want... In, in order for a company to get cooperation credit with the federal government, right, they want a corporation to notify the department of all relevant non-privileged facts and evidence about the misconduct and all of the individuals involved. And the problem there is if that conduct involved something that meets the mens rea of the criminal statutes like willfulness, intentionalist, intentionality, you know, that I think, Bob, it's, it's this willfulness that becomes a triggering issue, isn't it, for suspension and debarment when, when somebody sort of acts in that sort of manner, then that can translate into what you're talking about. Usually, but not always. So we're dealing with one right now where there was a negligent Clean Water Act violation that resulted in the statutory debarment. And EPA is looking at uh, discretionary debarment because of the negligent act. Um, I mean, obviously, we've got some responses and, and th th there's some things we can push back on, but it doesn't always require volitional conduct. And it usually does, but not always. The other point I would make is it can be tricky when you're trying to deal with suspension and debarment where you want to go present the company as a responsible company. This is a good corporate citizen. But if you're still in harm's way with the Department of Justice, you have to be pretty limited to what you can share, what you can disclose. Almost always suspension and debarment is going to get resolved after criminal and civil enforcement proceedings for a number of different reasons we don't need to get into now. But it's if you are going to engage proactively with the SDO, it can be a delicate discussion about you know how much we can share at this juncture, how much we can share later on. But the fill-up factor is what they're going to look at in terms of what is you know ethics and compliance. Are you are you re acting responsibly here? Uh, a lot of that's going to be overlap. And the prosecutor and the SDO are answering different questions, right? The prosecutor is trying to answer the question of what degree of culpability the individual or the company has for the underlying acts or that are the alleged violation. The SDO is asking a question related to the present responsibility of the company and its ability to be a trustworthy counterparty to the government in a, in a contractual relationship. So they are different inquiries. So to pick up on Bob's initial metaphor of the three-lane highway, in dealing with suspension and debarment issues in a variety of enforcement contexts, you want to know what the traffic looks like in each lane on the highway, right? Administrative, civil, criminal, you want to know where the Vespa is and where the big 18-wheeler is and how fast they're going and, and kind of keep your eyes on all three lanes. Without a doubt. So for example, if you are willing to pay pay a premium, not to have a corporate monitor as part of your criminal resolution. It, it makes no sense to do that if suspension and debarment official is going to insist upon a um, corporate monitor for purposes of suspension and debarment to avoid that problem. Yeah, you want to get yourself out of harm's way in all three lanes, but you got to keep your eye on all three lanes because it doesn't make sense to focus on just the one because the other two could catch you up pretty easily. I, I've seen increasingly that you can resolve criminal and civil together. Not the department process, but you're seeing more and more cases where a company says, well, if, if we're going to have a, a resolution, it has to resolve both sides of the civil and criminal piece, even though criminal typically goes first, and certainly from a trial standpoint, often goes first. There has been a degree of willingness inside of the Department of Justice to coordinate settlements on the criminal and civil side where allegations exist on, in both realms. Well, gentlemen, in the time that we have left, one of the things that I think would, would be helpful for our audience is to know of some areas in particular where suspension and debarment issues can be of particular risk, places where companies should be mindful of suspension and debarment issues. So what, what are some areas, Bob, that, that you've seen these issues be a higher risk than others? I would say... Certainly environmental, just because you have the statutory debarment provisions. So it's much more likely to hit the radar of the suspension and debarment official than other types of enforcement activities. If you are doing a lot of business with the government, you're more likely to end up on somebody's radar. And, and again, every agency has their own suspension and debarment official. So you could be facing debarment. It's not just an EPA thing or not just one particular agency. So any agency in theory could debar you. 
And if you end up being debarred, it applies company-wide. Just as an example, I've had clients before, individuals not doing business with the government, their employer wasn't doing business with the government, somebody who engaged in some curious accounting practices, they were doing business with the government, they got caught up in the whole thing. So they, everybody in sight got debarred. So you can find yourself in those kinds of, of situations. I think you also see it a lot where there are where there's enforcement initiatives. So for example, you know, you're going to see it a lot coming out of COVID, for example. So COVID fraud enforcement, some of the, the PPP loans, we're seeing a slow drip of criminal indictments coming out of those kinds of cases. Almost always they're going to be followed by suspension and debarment where there's, there's a real focus on, on the enforcement activities. Other than that, it, it, it can be a little random. I'm dealing right now with one, a FEMA grant. And there's some disagreement about what the regulations require, and that somehow has gotten referred to the suspension and debarment office. So it, it really can come from anywhere. And if there's government money involved, even, even if it's not direct government money, uh, you can find yourself caught up in the crosshairs. Yeah, one of those areas that Bob highlighted is definitely on the DOJ's top priority list, and that's pandemic-related fraud payments. I think that along with um, cryptocurrency and if you're a bad Russian. You are uh, in the targets of the of the Department of Justice. I would just say, in addition to so Bob flagged this, that there's a statutory debarment under, under several of the environmental statutes, but also there's an ability to find yourself in the criminal culpability realm based upon mere negligence, and that's very different than most of these other statutes that we're talking about. So it's the it's the coupling of those two things that gives rise to this being a heightened risk in the environmental world and. In particular, when you have an incident or an accident, uh, the concept, the notion of negligence is almost in the minds of enforcement folks has already been met because there was some significant amount of environmental damage or loss of human life that in their minds, and perhaps appropriately so, you know, says, well, that shouldn't happen. And so we have a duty, the people who are responsible for that facility had a duty that was breached that caused a harm, sort of taking us back to the classic elements from law school. And so Therefore, there's a criminal case here under these environmental statutes. And when you couple that in a circumstance, and Bob touched on this earlier, where you either are conducting operations on federal lands through some sort of authorization, a lease, or you're providing services to companies that conduct some of their operations on federal lands, then the consequences of suspension or debarment could be significant to you. So that's why I think those are the places where I think there's sort of a heightened sensitivity to, to these concepts. Yeah, and just to follow up real quick, it, it, it doesn't have to be criminal enforcement that can get you facing suspension and debarment issues. So this comes up not so much in the environmental space, but I do a lot of work under the Civil False Claims Act where there are whistleblower provisions so whistleblowers can file lawsuits and hope to earn a bounty for the efforts. So a lot of times you're thinking about resolving these civil fraud claims that are, I'll use the term frivolous because I do defense work and they're almost always frivolous, right? But you're trying to, let's, let's just make this go away. Let's just be done with this. Um, but you always want to think about suspension debarment because certainly civil fraud is a cause for debarment and you want to just be very thoughtful about, do we have to go fight this or can we just you know make this go away? And it can come up in lots of different contexts where it's not necessarily a criminal enforcement action. Yeah, I, I think Bob's right. Obviously. It- you know, it's his area of expertise and there's lots of context where this comes in. I, I think from my perspective as, you know, someone who does a lot of criminal work, it's definitely on the checklist. It's, you know, whatever counsel you're using, if you're, in, if you're interacting with the federal government over a significant investigation, you know, suspension and debarment should definitely be on your checklist of things you want to talk about. And I, you know, at the top of the podcast, I talked a little bit about that Western District of Texas case. You know, it has interesting facts that this this audience could face at any moment. And you know, it's an oil field company. It's a mechanical integrity issue. It's a produced water leak with a, a significant portion of hydrogen sulfide. And then where it turns bad is false statements to the Texas Railroad Commission, the death of an employee, then the death of his wife, who went to check on him, and there are two young children in a truck. And the EMS shows up and finds the two kids in the truck. So you get the the false statement, the deaths, and the what happened to the family, and 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 you get the government's attention, and and it's those false statements uh, to the railroad commission that I think would put them also with the suspension and debarment issue for you know for an upstream oil and gas company. So it doesn't necessarily need to be 
a lack of trustworthiness with respect to a federal program, it can be demonstrated in a lot of contexts. I, I think so. I'd be interested in Bob's reaction to that, but I, I certainly think so. So, I mean, the answer is yes and no. So, I mean, I apologize for the lawyer answer, but if you, if you look at the causes for debarment, it tends to be fraudulent type conduct. So bid rigging and, you know, those types of things. That being said, there are some catch-all provisions which cover anything that bears on your present responsibility, which you is so broad you can drive a truck through it. There's some case law talking about how it should be related to fraud type of, of activity, but it doesn't necessarily need to be limited to fraud type activity. If you're making false statements, if you're committing crimes, they, they're going to look at you as this is not a uh, this is not a trustworthy company. So yes and no. You can you can certainly, as, as I tell clients, if, if you're if you're explaining your case to a judge in a courtroom, you're already someplace you don't want to be, and it's it, you can find yourself there kind of easily. I think remember too, and we didn't really touch on this, but if you are in front of the suspension debarment office and you receive an adverse outcome, your ability to change that outcome is very limited. You have to go to an Article Three court and convince a district court judge that the suspension demarment officer was arbitrary and capricious in their decision. And you already have some sort of underlying culpability that gave rise to the suspension demarment officer's decision. So that's a hard story to tell. So I think it's, it just heightens the importance of being sure you tell the right story to the SDO and help them come to the right determination because your ability to appeal that decision is, is very limited. Well, that sounds like that's all the more reason to pay attention to the possibility of suspension, debarment, and disqualification early on and make it part of your holistic response to the beginnings of an enforcement action, Jason. Bob, we'll send it to you for any concluding thoughts about what you're seeing or any top practices that clients can implement into their their accountability systems to make sure they're, they're uh, looking at these kinds of issues and where their exposures are. I know it's general, but there really is no substitute for good corporate governance. That if you are talking to a suspension and debarment official, you want to say, I've taken ethics and compliance seriously since day one. Look at all these things that we've done that we did to avoid a problem. Once we found a problem, here's everything we did to fix the problem. That it's not necessarily a, a always a winning argument, but you always want to be on, you know, put you on the side of the angels if you can say this is stuff that we take very seriously, culture of compliance, tone at the top, all those types of things that once again, you can say this is a trustworthy company the government can feel comfortable doing business with. And it's going to help in your criminal enforcement, your civil enforcement, uh, everything else that you're doing. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Bob. Thank you as well, Kevin and Jason. And thank you most of all, our dear listeners for spending a little bit of time with us. We'll be returning to talk about contemporary and evolving trends in enforcement periodically. This will be a podcast that we do very regularly as we see new initiatives coming from DOJ, new initiatives coming from EPA and the other agencies that we pay attention to. And so do subscribe, do follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you like to stream your podcasts, and we'll be in touch soon. 